Now, settle in as we travel to Australia to examine a case from the early 20th century. Australia's Colin Campbell Ross was born in Melbourne on October 11, 1892. Thomas and Elizabeth Ross had five children total, with him being the middle child. Despite attending school and performing well academically, he was a timid youngster who had hardships in life with the death of his father in 1900. This meant that his mother had to provide for her children by 1904. The Australian Board of Education wanted all children to stay on at school until the age of 14, but many left by the time they were 12 to take up manual labouring jobs. There had been much talk between the educational establishments about children leaving school early. Some worried that when they left to start unskilled manual work, they would not only not possess much of an education, they would also not have the skills required in a changeable job markets. These arguments, however, had little importance to Colin's mother, Elizabeth Ross, as bringing up her children was difficult. And when Colin reached the age of 12, he finished his education and started to work in a local quarry, where he became known as a conscientious and reliable worker. He worked in the quarry for a few years before starting work as an assistant at the Broad Meadows Army Hospital. By 1920, Colin was working at the Donnybrook Hotel. His mother had taken on the license and had asked Colin and one of his brothers named Ronald to help her run it the country's finances. However, we're not doing very well. The First World War had greatly affected trade and the poor state of the British economy had reduced its demand for imports from Australia. Unemployment rose and people realised that the initial post-war boom of 1918 had ended. The hotel, however, prospered and Colin, along with his mother and brother, all worked hard to make it a nice place for people to visit. By now, Colin was 27 years old and he started to take out a young lady who worked at the hotel named Lily May Brown. The couple had only been courting for a short time when on the 5th of May, he proposed to her. Lily was somewhat shocked by this and told him that she was not ready to get married. Colin, however, did not want to accept her answer. He pleaded with her to reconsider and even threatened her with a gun. Lily quickly left, but Colin was still determined to win her over, to convince her to marry him. He followed her onto a tram, and in order to pacify him, she said that she would reconsider his proposal and agreed to meet him later that day. However, she had no intention of doing this and instead went to the police station. She was advised to keep the appointment and together with two plainclothes policemen, went to meet Colin before he had a chance to speak to her. The policeman arrested him and he was charged with carrying an unlicensed firearm and using threatening words. Colin was later fined and placed on a good behavior bond. In early 1921, Colin's mother gave up the license at the Donnybrook Hotel. Colin then took a lease on a wine bar in the city's Eastern Arcade. This was a two-level building constructed in the 1870s, which contained a variety of shops. The arcade had always been a nice place for people to shop, but Colin's wine bar soon acquired a less from favourable reputation. The bar had previously been frequented by couples on a night out. However, soon after Colin took over, it became the preferred meeting point of sex workers, criminals and alcoholics. He worked with two of his brothers and employed a barmaid named Ivy Matthews. On the 13th of October 1921, a gentleman who had been drinking in the wine bar was attacked in the lavatory. As the gentleman tried to defend himself, he was shot. Police and paramedics soon arrived. Fortunately, the injuries were not life-threatening and the police tried to talk to the victim. However, he was not able to describe his attacker as at the time he was very drunk. The police investigated the incident. They were aware of the reputation that the wine bar now had and of the clientele it attracted. They arrested a young Englishman named Frank Walsh. He was visiting Australia and seemed to spend much time drinking. He told them that Mr. Colin Ross had informed him that the victim always carried a lot of money on his person. So if he robbed him and took his money, they could divide the proceeds between them. Colin Ross was arrested and charged with armed robbery. The police, however, found it difficult to construct a clear picture of exactly who had been involved. The wine bar was frequented by some rather unsavoury characters. Ivy Matthews, a bartender who went by the name Bar Manager, was another individual who had been charged. Frank Walsh was eventually found guilty of the shooting and robbery 
and sentenced to six months hard labor, while Colin Ross was acquitted of all charges. However, the incident had left some bad feeling between Colin and the barmaid, and following his acquittal, Ivy Matthews was dismissed from her position. Nell Almatursky lived with her sister and grandmother. She was 12 years old and had already seen much tragedy in her life. Although born in Australia, she'd lived in Africa, where her father had worked for a mining company and the family's returned to Australia. Her mother died and was buried at sea. Her father was unable to look after his two daughters. So Alma and her sister went to Melbourne to live with their grandparents named Henry and Elizabeth Tursky. In 1921, Alma's grandfather died and it became the sole responsibility of her grandmother to look after her and her sister Viola. Alma was an intelligent child. She was a hard worker who consistently performed well in school, but she was also a somewhat reserved person who found it difficult to make friends. On Friday, December 30th, 1921 in the afternoon, Alma's grandmother Elizabeth requested her to go to the Swanston Street butcher store and pick up a box of meats, which she was to take to her aunt's house. She'd visited the butcher's store numerous times, where her uncle was a secretary. Once at the store, Alma went to get the meats, but her uncle was not there, so she left and travelled to Collins Streets to live with her aunt. But Alma never went back home. Her grandma got quite concerned as Al was dying and informed the authorities of her granddaughter's absence. The death of a small child was discovered in Gun Alley, which is very close to Collins Streets, the following morning after the family and the police searched for her for hours. She had been assaulted and strangled. Newspaper reporters are very quick to arrive at the scene, and news of the murder of 12-year-old Alma became front-page news. An investigation began, and many witnesses came forward who had seen Alma walking and carrying the parcel of meats. The majority of these witnesses said that they saw her sometime between 2.30 and 3.00 p.m., but the pathologist had put the time of her death at around 6.00 p.m. The police interviewed many people, but every time they thought that they were establishing some sort of theory to who may have killed Alma, they found evidence for disproved its. The press continued to report the story, and the residents of Melbourne were on alert. Many parents would not let their children go out alone. The press criticised the investigation, and with what seemed little progress, pressure started to grow for the police to make an arrest. A substantial reward of 1250 LEBs was offered for information that would lead to a conviction of the perpetrator of this terrible crime. Colin Ross was known to local police. He had recently been acquitted of the armed robbery charge against a customer of his wine bar. He had already been interviewed by them about the murder and cooperated with the inquiry. He had witnesses who could confirm that he was working at his wine bar on the day in question and that he had not left it. He said that he had seen a girl who he thought was Alma. He said he saw her twice walking through the arcade. He had spent the afternoon with his girlfriend, Miss Gladys Lindemann, who had come to see him while he was working. He met her again in the evening at 9.00 p.m. in the city centre. There were customers who he had been serving throughout the day. However, the police were not convinced. I had a statement from Colin Ross's previous barmaid, who had been dismissed from his employment. She told the police that he had told her that he had committed the crime. However, before the large reward was offered, Ivy Matthews had made a statement saying that she knew nothing about what has happened. On the 30th of December 1921, Colin had given up the lease on his wine bar. He had decided to do this after he was accused of attacking and robbing a customer. The police visited his property, they had no other leads so decided to conduct a thorough search. They found strands of hair on a blanket on a sofa and considered this sufficient evidence to charge Colin Campbell Ross with murder. The newspapers continued to publish stories about the case, including statements from witnesses. One was from a gentleman named Sidney John Harding. He was in prison awaiting trial for robbery and had many previous convictions. He had told the police that following Colin Ross's arrest, he'd admitted to him that he had committed the crime. For this information, Mr. Harding was to receive 250 Libyes plus, a reduced sentence due to his services to the States. Despite Colin Ross proclaiming his innocence, the media seemed to have decided that he was guilty. The trial of Colin Campbell Ross began on the 20th of February 1922, and he pleaded not guilty. 
The prosecution stated that 12-year-old Alma entered the defendant's wine bar at around 3 Antro p.m. on Friday the 30th of December 1921. He had then given her a drink before abusing and strangling her. A witness named Olive May Maddox, who at the time of the murder was on police bail, told the court that she had seen Elmer in the back of the wine bar behind a curtain. When she was asked why she hadn't told the police this information until after the substantial reward money had been offered, she said that she was afraid to do so due to her own previous convictions, but informed the court that Ivy Matthews had assured her that she should make a statement. The strands of hair found on the blanket at Colin Ross's house were compared with samples of Alma's hair and had been analysed by a trained chemist named Charles Price. He told the courts that it had been several years since he had last examined hair samples and concluded that the hairs on the blankets were a different colour and diameter to the hairs taken from the deceased. He added that it was possible but not really probable, but the hairs had come from someone other than Alma. His evidence seemed contradictory and Colin Ross's barrister named Thomas Brennan requested for an examination of the hair be carried out by a more qualified person. The judge, however, turned down this request. When the trial ended, the jury was sent out to the liberates. They returned to find the defendants guilty, and the judge sentenced him to death. Although the newspapers and much of the Melbourne public had decided on his guilt before the trial had even started, Colin Campbell. Ross continued to protest his innocence. His friends, family, and legal representatives were all convinced that he was innocent. They tried to remind the press and the public that the prosecution's case was strengthened by two witnesses who testified against him, both of who who claimed that Colin Ross had confessed to the crime. One was a convicted criminal who was in prison with Colin, and the other was a former barmaid of the wine bar who Colin Ross had dismissed from his employment. Public opinion, however, seemed to be very much against him and his lawyers. Application for an appeal was refused as the judge said that Colin Ross's guilt had been proven beyond doubts. His lawyers even tried to appeal to the Privy Council in England, but this application was also denied. On the 23rd of April 1922, a letter was sent to the prison. The person who wrote it claimed to be the actual killer. He said that he felt guilty for what he had done, but would not come forward and confess to the crime. Colin Campbell Ross walked to the gallows. On Monday the 24th of April 1922, he handed over a letter that would be given to his family in which he wrote, The day is coming when my innocence will be proved. When asked if he had anything to say before his death, in a resolute and dignified manner, he said, I am now face to face with my maker, and I swear by almighty gods that I am an innocent man. I never saw the child, I never committed the crime and I don't know who did. I never confessed to anyone. I beseech God to pardon those who have betrayed my life. And I beseech God to show mercy to my dear mother and my family. After that, Colin Campbell Ross was hung. Colin's innocence was always maintained by his family and attorney Thomas Brennan. However, it wasn't until 1993, 70 years later. But further evidence was found when a man by the name of Kevin Morgan began to investigate the matter. He found that on the afternoon of December 30th, six trustworthy witnesses had reported that Colin had been in the wine bar. However, both this data and a statement made by a taxi driver called Joseph Graham were withheld from the courts, who had heard screams coming from a building in Collins Street at 3 miles p.m. that day. But his account had been discharged by police and he had not been called to give evidence. After Colin Ross was arrested, Joseph Graham again tried to get his statement heard, but was told that he would not be permitted to testify in court. Remarkably, the file which contained all the evidence of the case was found at the Melbourne Office of Public Prosecutions and still contained the original hair samples. It was later agreed that these samples could be sent for DNA testing, the results of which discovered that the hair on the blankets did not match that of the victim, Nell Almaturtsky. On the 22nd of April 1922, Australia had hanged an innocent man. 86 years later, on the 27th of May 2008, Colin Campbell Ross was granted a posthumous pardon. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, 
please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next briefcase.